Just because somebody reports that they had myopericarditis doesn't mean that it's related to the vaccine. Myopericarditis is an inflammation of the heart that can affect the heart muscle and the heart's electrical system. There are reported cases of this viral infection in individuals 30 years and younger who received their second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Should this news make individuals hesitant about the vaccine? When you look at the other side, okay, well, what if we don't get the vaccine? Well, not quite three and a half million children in the U.S are known to have been infected with COVID. 400 of them have died. Nobody's died of myopericarditis from the vaccine at this point. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on Monday, June the 14th, 2021. And boy, is it hot up here in the Midwest <laughs> and elsewhere. Welcome today again to Dr. Greg Poland, virologist, infectious disease, and vaccine expert from Mayo Clinic. Hi, Greg. Well, good morning. Good morning. How wonderful to see you on a Monday morning. And you, so brightly dressed. It's a pleasure. Well, sunshiny. I've just been in a Sedona hiking ah. over the weekend, and I have to say it was hotter in Minnesota than it was in Sedona, interestingly. <laughs> Crazy weather. Isn't that something? Well, how are you today, Greg? I'm doing pretty well. Um, you know, things have quieted down a bit in regards to COVID. I'm sure we'll talk about that with, with one new area that uh, we should talk about in regards to a side effect that might be happening in kids. All right. We will get to that, Greg. But you said things have quieted down, but not everywhere, Greg. Have no, you heard about true. these cicadas in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> they actually kept a plane full of journalists uh, traveling with Biden from being able to take off because they filled the engine. I saw that. Uh, yeah, this is really a, an amazing phenomena that's hard to explain to me on any kind of rational basis. I'm glad they haven't made it to my spot in Minnesota yet at there the Mayo go. Clinic. So. It's been quiet. <laughs> I'm hoping, hoping. <laughs> Well, Greg, I, I know that we have COVID news that you want to share, but I would like to ask, just discuss some COVID news first. I read about a yellow lab named Buffy oh, yeah. who was able to sniff out patients with COVID at a hospital in Sarasota, Florida. Isn't that fascinating? It, it is. And you know, what's really interesting to me, we don't really understand the human mind-body interface very well. Now you take the olfactory or smelling system of a dog where they have many fold higher number of nerve cells that are involved in smelling. They're using dogs now to detect diabetes, bombs, as you know, uh, for, for uh, uh, airline security, for when people are about to have a seizure. I mean, it, it's just amazing what these animals are capable of. In the case of COVID, What's really fascinating to me is, and as a scientist, in one way, I hate to say it, but dogs are as good or better than our most sophisticated molecular testing. Oh, that's something. <laughs> With all the money that's gone into to testing exactly. COVID, we uh, could have just been having yellow labs and their man's best friend too. And, and you know, not only that in hospitals, as I'm sure you, you know, um, because we do it at Mayo too, but Dogs are also used as, uh, uh, as part of the therapeutic mm -hmm. treatment. Uh, mm -hmm. Studies have shown that when a dog like a yellow lab comes towards you, your blood pressure and heart rate almost automatically start going down. It's really an interesting phenomenon that deserves a lot more research. It really is very interesting. I guess we've got to get to some serious COVID news, Greg. <laughs> Tell me what the numbers in the United mm. States are looking like. Well, you know, this is wonderful. The numbers are way, 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 way down. Now there's some- Woo, Good news on Monday. I know, you know, we hardly ever get to talk about that. You know, there's some spotty areas where that's not the case. However, and you know, sometimes as a scientist, you end up being the, the Debbie Downer. <laughs> I wanna <laughs> remind people that if we looked at uh, the incidence curve from last year at about this time, it was equally low. So this does this represent the natural seasonal variation? Is it because we've got about half of people immunized? 
Uh, oh, is it, it that it, many now? Half? Yeah, yeah. We're really, we're really getting up there. Now we're stagnating at the 50 to 70 percent, depending on which state you look at. Some states are already at 70 percent. Other states way below that. So, so is it that? I think we won't know, just as we didn't know last year, until we get to fall. Our biggest concern is that with immunization rates at 50%, we're going to see another surge this fall with these much more infectious variants. Well, Greg, which leads us to a discussion about variants. Um, there are many <laughs> variants in the World Health Organization has started and naming them Alpha, Beta, Gamma, yeah, Delta, right. I think. And I think it's the Delta variant that's a particular concern to us. Why? Well, yeah, there's there's a, there's a number of variants that, that are of concern. So last summer, we were at really low numbers. Then we had a major upsurge. And the reason for that was the Alpha or so-called UK variant. The Beta variant is the um, South African variant. That turns out to be more infectious. The one we're really struggling with and concerned about around the world is the so-called India or 617 or Delta. It gets very confusing. Delta variant, which is another 50% above the alpha variant in transmissibility and infectivity. Mm. So uh, this, this is of grave concern. It's at about 6% or so of the sequences currently detected in the U.S. So this is something to really keep our eye on. And, it, and it's, why, it's, it's why I've mentioned, Helena, that for, as I look at these data, we, we will enter into, we're in, and this fall, really enter into, in many ways, the most dangerous phase of the pandemic for people who have not been vaccinated. Why? Because they're facing a variant that's much more infectious has about fourfold higher viral loads in their system and likely more severe disease. So, so it's actually more dangerous now more than ever to be unvaccinated. All right, good reminder to get vaccinated. Tell me also, Greg, about um, the, the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization raising concerns about a two-track pandemic. What does that mean? So Helena, this two-track idea relates to the idea that out in the West, we have ready access to the vaccine. Outside of the West, many countries have very limited access. So they continue to have a pandemic in some countries out of control, where, where ours is now down at its lowest level. So two different courses of that pandemic. The danger being, as long as it's out of control there and there's travel, they will constantly reintroduce it to the U.S. because Those tracks they are, are going to converge, is what exactly. you're saying. Exactly. All right, Greg. Um, another thing that I had seen in the news today and wanted to ask you about was that I uh, saw that the CDC is holding an emergency hearing about heart inflammation after the um, vaccination. Yeah. So this is a this is an area of of concern, and I want to I want to take our listeners through this. You and I have worked very hard to be as transparent as, the, as we know the data and explain it to them. So this past week, there was a meeting at FDA. This Friday, there'll be a meeting at CDC. Those are publicly, everything we do as vaccinologists is public. Anybody can tune in and watch those. Here's the issue. There have been about 789 cases of what's called myopericarditis. That means inflammation of the muscle, myo, mm -hmm. or the what looks like a piece of saran wrap that surrounds the heart called the pericardium. So inflammation of that. That can happen for a whole variety of reasons. Commonly occurs after influenza, for example, and other viruses respiratory viruses, and primarily in children. So there's a certain background rate. That's why we're being very careful here to say, what is causative, what's background rate. In this case, I'm gonna step out a little forward and say, to my eyes, these data suggest a rate higher than background. Okay. And let me, let me tell you why. So of the 789 cases, this is across all ages, it's mostly occurring after the second dose, males 
far more than females, which is true for the background rate, with a mean age of about 24 years. Mm -hmm. Now let's take out of that 789, the 470 that have occurred in people under the age of 30. We have data on 285 cases. So just one side point here, just because somebody reports that they had myopericarditis doesn't mean that it's related to the vaccine. So a sure. lot of work has to go in examining every medical record. One of them might have been uh, occurring three weeks before the vaccine and they're just now reporting it. So of the, um, of the 285 cases where we have data, 270 of them have been discharged, had no complications, nothing like that. 15 still in the hospital and three in the ICU. So let's break that down a little further. The number of cases that have occurred in kids 16 to 17 is about 79 cases. You expect between two and 20 cases by background rates. How about in uh, kids, well, young adults, 18 to 24? There have been 196 cases and you expect between eight and 80 cases, okay. so quite an elevation. So the trick now is we gotta go in, look at each medical record, determine when, first of all, was the diagnosis correct? And right. second of all, when in relation to the vaccine. If it happened before, clearly it wasn't related. If it happened you know, year, months later, it clearly not related. So you're looking for a temporal relationship. Those data are gonna be uh, presented on Friday and decisions made. Right now, the CDC continues, and I think it's the appropriate uh, recommendation to recommend it for kids 12 and older. When you look at the other side, okay, well, what if we don't get the vaccine? Well, uh, not quite three and a half million children in the U.S. are known to have been infected with COVID. 400 of them have died. Nobody's died of myopericarditis from the vaccine at this point, but 400 have died. Um, now, those are unequal denominators, right. but just to make the case that whatever decision we make, and you and I have talked about this, it's true for everything. There's some level of risk. What we're looking for is much more benefit and much less risk. So Greg, uh, you talked about the accuracy of diagnosis. How do you diagnose myopericarditis? And do we know, are all these cases actually documented with uh, diagnostics? Right, really good question because they're not all documented and that's the research that, that has to go on. So the typical way that you diagnose it is a patient comes in and complains that they have chest pain or they're short of breath or their heart is fluttering you'll do an EKG, you'll do an echocardiogram so we can look at the muscle of the heart and you'll do what's called cardiac enzymes, a blood test. Mm -hmm. When those are abnormal, we can make the diagnosis. Now, what do we do for it? The vast majority of cases monitor their heart rhythm and rest. And they're, they're, the vast majority are very mild. In fact, if, if I didn't say it, uh, it probably occurs much more commonly than we, we are aware of. It's just that we don't diagnose this because sure. it's transient, it's mild, it goes away on its own. Mm -hmm. What you're looking for are the cases that can cause problems. So when somebody has more severe symptoms or more prolonged symptoms, that's a, that's a time when, you know, if you've gotten the vaccine and those are symptoms, you should report those to your physician or healthcare provider so that it can be looked into. Yes. So supportive care was what we would call that. Or, supportive. Yeah. Um, well, great information. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Now we started this out very positively by saying that the case numbers were down. Anything else that you'd like to share with us today? Um, I think the other uh, news that's really interesting is, uh, you know, there's something called monoclonal antibodies. Yes. These are synthesized antibodies that attack the virus and prevent it from infecting. So <clears throat> we've been using monoclonal antibodies. In fact, at Mayo Clinic, we've been one of the leaders in using monoclonal antibodies. Well, one of the, it's a two, it's a two monoclonal combination made by Regeneron, <clears throat> excuse me. They have now developed a formulation 
where you can give half the dose subcutaneously. In the past, it's required admission to the hospital to give it by IV. Oh, and yeah. they're now testing this in younger and younger ages at lower and lower doses, and it's working well. So this is an, another example where we can rescue somebody if we catch them early enough who's gotten infected and treat them. The other really interesting paper that came out was the use of those in nursing home patients who had not yet gotten the vaccine, but there were cases in the nursing home. It also involved the workers there. So they prophylactically gave them the monoclonal antibody and it worked. It prevented wow. infection. So you can prevent and treat. So I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. Um, the other interesting thing that uh, has been gathering some momentum is the idea of next gen or next generation vaccines. And two of those that are being worked on are oral pill interesting. vaccines against COVID. And another manufacturer is working on a patch, something like a Band-Aid that you could put on to immunize. So, you know, if there's if there's a silver lining, and it's a funny thing to say, but if there's a silver lining in this tragedy that has been the pandemic, is like many tragedies, it sparks innovation and research that will eventually benefit all of us. It has been absolutely amazing. I, I, I think the sub-Q delivery of the monoclonal antibodies is amazing. I know here at Mayo, we've been using some outpatient infusion centers because I believe, at least initially, that some of the thought behind using monoclonal antibodies was to keep individuals from becoming hospitalized, I think. Exactly. But they were having to go in five days in a row, I think, wow. to receive their antibody. But now sub-Q, that would be a... Yeah, so you can do great. it outpatient. You can do it, right. you know, home therapy. So that's a game changer. Yeah. The only, uh, the only other thing is, as we've sort of touched upon, are the variants. A lot of work going into sequencing and understanding. And I know we've said it before, but I wanna just briefly make the point again. What we knew and what our listeners um, have learned over the past year, some of that information will not hold true as we go forward because mm -hmm. we're facing variants that are much more infectious. So you look last year, it was rare for a child to get infected with symptomatic infection or be hospitalized. Now in the US with some of these variants, 20, 25% of the COVID hospitalizations are now in kids. Oh my goodness. So, so information is gonna change as we know more and more about these variants. Well, if there's anything we've learned over this pandemic is that information changes, right? Yeah, indeed. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we, learn, we learn as we're going along. We're forced to. Uh, right. This is a new virus. Well, thank you so much, Greg. Yes, Lots of, of interesting information today, including uh, COVID sniffing dogs in Florida. <laughs> Cicadas, dogs, uh, and right. humans. <laughs> well, thanks for being here today, Greg. My pleasure. Our thanks to Dr. Greg Poland for being here today to give us our COVID update. Dr. Poland is an infectious disease expert at Mayo Clinic, and I hope that you learned something today. I know that I did. We wish each of you a very wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.